together. Let me pray, and then we'll dive into the Word. God, I am so, so thankful for the last 16 years uh, to be able to call this my family. Um, Lord, just, um, huh, yeah, the faces of refuge and the people of refuge and the, the families that make up refuge. Uh, Lord, in all of our imperfections and the things that uh, sometimes we just don't get right, uh, but Lord, the things that we've walked through together, Lord, and, and for a long time, and, and Lord, the, the, the people who are so faithful to you and, and the storms and the things that have happened in their lives, and they've been faithful to you. And Lord, that is what makes up this family. And I'm so thankful for that. Uh, Lord, so thankful for Marty's words last night. It's family. We're family. And so, Lord, this morning, would you work in this family? Would you, would you call people, uh, Lord, to walk with you? And, and maybe even, Lord, you would u- just use this morning as a way to transform and change hearts and minds uh, like you are so faithful in doing. We just sang about it, your faithfulness. So, Lord, this morning, we believe that you have a, a big plan for us. Lord, help, we, help us to be attentive to that and sensitive to the leading of your Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh. Okay. So I want you to look at the cards real quick, the, the cards that you were given as you walked in. I know you always already read it, so I'm not going to read it again. Uh, but this comes from Mark chapter 10, verse 27. And I, I want to read this to you. And, and here's what it says. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And here's the question I would ask you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that with God, all things are possible? I mean, take a second, take that in for a minute. Do I really believe that with God, all things are possible? I mean, I know with men, not things, all things are possible, right? That, that's true. Uh, humans fail us on a regular basis. But when we talk about the things of God and we talk about our Father, who is the Lord, do I really truly believe that all things are possible with Him? And then I would point you to last week's message where Pastor Bill taught about the disciples and they were in this boat. Do you remember this? They were in this boat. And do you remember what was going on with that boat? Right? The, the waves and the wind and the, the storm had attacked this boat. So much so that the disciples were afraid that they were all going to die. And what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. But then what did Jesus do? He calmed the storm. He calmed the storm. He had authority and power over the storm. So then I take you back to Mark chapter 10, and I say, do you believe that God is, po- is it possible for God to do all things? Is there anything that's impossible for him to do? If he can calm the winds and the waves, if he can calm the storms of nature, then is there anything that he can't do? And do you remember the response of the disciples as they're in the boat and the storm is calmed? I mean, frantic, they're, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And all of a sudden, shh, calm. Remember the response? Here it is. Mark 4, 41. It says this. And Mark records this. And they feared exceedingly when Jesus calmed the storm. They feared exceedingly. And here's what they said. And said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They didn't know what category to put Jesus in right? I mean, we've seen him cast out demons and we've seen him heal people, but we've never seen someone calm a storm before, that even the wind and the waves, they obey his power and authority. And the question this morning is, if Jesus can calm the wind and the sea, can he calm the storms inside me? If he can calm the wind and the sea, can he calm the storms that are inside me and inside you? Does he have the power and the authority to work on a human level? Does he even care about working on a human level? And if I can answer yes to both of those, then if I also believe that he's a God who can do all things, there's nothing impossible for him, then we have power. Then then we can go somewhere with this thing we call Christianity and following after Jesus and our faith. If you would, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to catch Jesus just after he gets out of that boat where there was that massive storm and he calms the sea. We're now catching him as he's getting up onto shore. 
And he's going to meet someone very interesting, someone who we would say has a massive storm going on in their lives, a massive personal and spiritual storm. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what it says. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. Now Jesus is going to the other side of the lake. He's going to the other side of the sea, the place probably more than likely inhabited by mostly Gentiles and and uh, Greek-cultured Gentiles, not religious Jews. So he kind of enters this land that most Jews would have said, ah, whatever with them, right? Get rid of them. We don't need to go over there. And yet Jesus goes through this massive storm to get to the other side of the tracks, the other side of the sea, because he's got a mission that he's on. In fact, he goes someplace specific. Where does he go? The tombs, right? He goes to the graveyard, a place that Jews wouldn't have gone either because there's death there. That's unclean. And yet Jesus goes to this place that would have been considered completely unclean. The the spiritual image there is darkness. And Jesus walks into the darkness. And who meets him there? Who meets him there? This man that's possessed by demons. In fact, Matthew records that there were two men in that graveyard that were possessed by by demons. Mark and Luke only record one, and I would just suggest that possibly it's because that's the one that Jesus has the biggest impact. His life is, is going to be forever changed. We're going to look at that here this morning. That, that, that Mark and Luke are recording the man that was changed. What is Jesus dealing with as he approaches this man? Uh, Matthew 8.28, you can just jot it down, I'll read it to you. Matthew 8.28 says this, They were so fierce, these two demon-possessed men, that none could pass by. Think how crazy that is, that if you were going that direction, you would take a big circle around the opposite way, just not to deal with these two men who roamed the hills and the tombs and were extremely scary, by the way, screaming and hollering. You would just stay away from them altogether. Look at Mark chapter 5 again, verse 3. It says, he could no longer be restrained even with a chain. This dude is being restrained with chains by people because he's so out of control. Not only that, but there's a certain spiritual strength that he has, superhuman, that he can break those chains and and shatter the shackles. Listen, this is not a guy you want to bump into, right? Right? I mean, this is not the person you're like, hey, all right, they're welcoming us, right? No, this man is out of his mind. I actually believe that the enemy intended to try to get Jesus and the disciples to get back into the boat and go back to the other side of the sea. That if I could scare these guys enough and send enough at them, maybe, maybe they won't spread the light into the darkness, that if I could get Jesus, just go back into the boat and get to the other side. So this man comes out running, and it was me, I would have gone back in the boat, right? This is is more than I can bear. I'm sure the disciples are like half foot in, already ready to go. Like, please, let's go, Jesus. They don't want us over here. But Jesus isn't about that. In fact, Jesus is about something altogether different. In fact, a couple weeks ago, uh, we, we talked about this little, tiny, 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 insignificant seed. You remember what kind of seed it was? The mustard seed, 
right? This little tiny insignificant seed, which Jesus says grows into this massive bush, so big that birds can even come and nest in that bush. And remember the the point that Jesus was making is that this mustard seed has all this power inside of it, even to grow to an unexplainable size. Like, I don't even know how all that can come from that little tiny seed. And you remember what he likened it to? He said, it's the, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It tar- starts out so small and seemingly insignificant, but grows into this large bush. And I would suggest to you that while it looks like Jesus came across to see to redeem this man, there's actually a bigger picture that we're going to see at the end that I believe that Jesus is planting a mustard seed in this, little, in this man, which, by the way, he seems so insignificant like crazy, out of his mind. But I will show you by the end of this message that there is great power in this man, authority given to him. We'll see that here in a moment. What Jesus is doing is saying, I'm not getting back in the boat. I'm not running away from darkness. In fact, I'm going straight into darkness because I believe my father has a bigger plan for this man than what you've been using him for, enemy. (laughs) Look at verse seven. With a shriek, He screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man." This image would have been so heartbreaking, right? That there's this, a devastation that's gone on in this man's life. And regardless of, of how this happened, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us that, but the devastation and the havoc wreaked by the enemy on this man's life. We don't know if he was a son or a father or a, a, a worker or whatever he was, but whatever it was, he wasn't that now. The, the, the person that comes to meet Jesus is somebody altogether different than who he once was. And here's the thing. When Jesus is approached by this man, you know what Jesus sees? He sees a man that was created in the image of God. There's a, there's a love that Jesus has for, for people because he sees through the brokenness and he sees that each and every person that was created was created in his Father's image. In fact, all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, here's what it says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That means every person was created in the image of God with a purpose and a plan and a calling on their life. Now, what happens over time, and you and I both know this, maybe out of our own experiences, is that image gets marred over time and broken down over time. The world and the enemy, and even ourselves at times, consider us valueless at times. And we get broken through sin, and, 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 and things get messy and muddy and murky in our lives, and we forget this truth and this reality, which Jesus can see so clearly today through that man. He sees that man approaching him, that screaming man, the angry man, and he says, that man was created in the image of God. Now think about that. How would that affect the way you view people today? Those people who are are broken and lost and hurting, people who have different views than you. But what if you viewed them as being in the image of God? This man has value. This woman has value because she was created, he was created in the image of God. And I might not like what I see. Do you think Jesus walks out and he's like, this man's running at me and he's demon possessed? I like what I see here. No, but he has value to this man. He doesn't get back in the boat and say, let's get away from here. In fact, he enters in to the battle of the storm of this man's life. He enters the storm when it would have been easier to get back in the boat and go away. Listen, Jesus got a purpose and a plan. It's redemption. Jesus is coming to redeem this man. And despite all the the effects of the enemy on his life, he sees value in him. And I would say, listen, we need to see value in the people who we don't even agree with, or maybe who are so broken and hurt that they're angry 
And we say, listen, Lord, I know you've given them value because you created them in your image. It's so important for us today as the church to recognize people, people who God loves and desires to redeem and to save and to restore, much like this man. Now, I want you to see something I think is so interesting in verse 7. Look at verse 7. Look what the, the, the man possessed by demons says to Jesus. Why are you interfering with me? Why have you come across the sea, come up onto my beach, and now why are you interfering with me? That's such an interesting statement. It's almost like the, the demons are saying, hey, we're working here, right? Right? We're ruining this man's life. This is what we do. And you've come to interfere with us. In fact, Jesus, we've got this region. This region is ours. Go back to the other side and stop interfering with us. The enemy has not changed in over 2,000 years. He was the same yesterday. and He'll be the same today. And he'll be the same down the line as well. He wants to destroy God's image. He wants to mar those that are created in the image of God, the ones that God loves and treasures. And the enemy would love to make you just like this demoniac, broken and hurting and lost and confused and in some ways out of your mind. That's his plan for your life. And it's working in some people, amen? I mean, there are people who are so confused that have forgotten about the living God altogether, would question whether God loves them at all, that the enemy is at work even today. And he says to Jesus, why are you interfering with my work, right? In fact, this is the warning that Peter gives. He says, uh, be sober, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Devour. Devour. This man has been devoured by the enemy. We see people today, people, your co-workers maybe, maybe they're not demon-possessed. Maybe they are. (laughs) You have family members who are lost, who I would say have been devoured by the enemy. They've, been, they've bought hook, line, and sinker into the lies of the enemy. And they're not walking with the Lord at all. They don't even know him. They've been devoured. And he, he's saying to you, be sober, be vigilant. Know that you are working against the enemy. Jesus, though, comes with the purpose of interfering with the enemy's work. Jesus comes strictly to destroy the works of the enemy. In fact, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where there's this promise that Messiah will come and will what? Crush the head of the, of the serpent, of the enemy. It's gonna, the Messiah will come and he will crush the head of the enemy. This is a bit of that crushing going on right here. We know ultimately it happens on the cross, but this is a little bit of a sign of like, oh, Jesus is someone special. He's, a, he's going to go to work against the enemy. He's going to interfere with his work. In fact, look at this text. This is actually 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3, 8. And it says this, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. In other words, he arrives onto the scene. He makes himself known. That he might destroy the works of the what? Of the devil. That one of the signs that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's here, is his ability to deal with the demonic forces. Is the ability to calm the storms of the demonic forces. To have power and authority over those demonic forces. He's come to destroy the work of the one who wants to devour you and I. And can I encourage you with this? One of the callings of being a Christian or a follower of Christ is that we interfere with the work of the enemy. That on behalf of other people, maybe who are blinded to the things of the Lord, that you and I are actually called to be brave and courageous and enter into the battle to say, listen, I'm not getting back into the boat because I believe God's called me to this place in this darkness right now in this time to interfere with the work of the enemy that he's doing on my son and my daughter, on my grandkids, on my coworker, on my family members, on the guy next door. I believe that the enemy is at work and and I'm, I'm being sent 
with the, please, please listen, with the heart of Christ, with a love for them. This, Jesus doesn't come to bash the man who's demonically possessed. There's been enough bashing, right? He's been chained up, right? He knows people don't like him. He's scary, right? Jesus comes with the heart to redeem this man. We go to represent the one who, who has a heart to redeem our lost friends, our lost relatives, that, that when we show up, it's like, hey, listen, I'm here to interfere with the work of the enemy in your life. I'm not going to lay back. I'm not going to sit back and let the enemy take hold of your life on a regular basis. I'm here to be an interference with the heart of Christ. And again, I, I will just encourage you, that takes bravery. <laughs> it does. It takes courage, and it keeps leading by the Lord. Lord, you have to lead me by your Holy Spirit. Now, that's a scary thing. I, I totally get it right? But can I encourage you with this? It is not your power and your authority that's going to save or redeem any of your relatives or your coworkers. You'll never do it with your own human words, like some cool statement that you say, and it's like, oh, I'm saved now, right? It, that's never going to happen. Here's why. Because it's the same power and authority that redeems this man from demonic possession is the same power and authority that will redeem your lost loved one or your lost relative or your lost friend or neighbor. Those people were redeemed by the power and authority in the name of Jesus. Look at, look at this in verse 6, if you would. As Jesus gets out of the boat, the guy comes uh, running to Jesus. And what does he do? bows low before him. There's this recognition about who Jesus truly is. Even the demonic realm recognizes the power and authority given to Jesus. So you don't go and, and, and mess with the enemy by yourself. You don't get intertwined in, in, in your co-workers' lives to, for redemption purposes by yourself. You, you come with the name of Jesus and the power and authority that he has. Look at verse 7. Look at what they identified Jesus as. Who they identified Jesus as. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. This is who we do battle with, right? We come in the name of Jesus and we mess with the enemy, right? He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Why are you interfering with us, Jesus? Get away. Go back. And, and the same thing is said of you. Why are you interfering with my life? Because I love you. Because God loves you. He sent me to come and interfere in your life. And then Mark wants us to know that he's not just messing with a guy who has a demon, although that probably would be enough, right? One demon, enough, right? <laughs> That's scary enough. This guy has, a, with the, the demon says, we are legion, we are many. A legion in that time, would, it could have been a Roman army that had anywhere between four and 6,000 people, right? In the legion. So I would just make the argument, he's saying, there's lots of us in here, probably thousands. So he's not just messing with one demon. Mark wants us to know, this is a man who had many demons inside of him. Jesus crosses the sea, he goes through the storm, he's going to a region filled with darkness, enters into the tombs that were, would have been unclean, he faces this enemy head on. Why? To restore this man back to life. To give this man back what would have been taken from him. And then we get one of the most amazing scenes in all of Scripture. Look at verse 10. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again, not to send them to some distant place. In other words, don't make us leave the region. We've been doing so much bad here, so much evil. We don't want to leave and start a new work someplace else. Leave us in this man or just leave us somewhere in this region because we got people, we got demons at work here. Let us stay here. Verse 11, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Take that in for a second. That's a shocking, shocking, vivid image. 
Imagine if you're a disciple that day and you just got off the boat and there was the storm and you thought you were going to die and you thought, okay, let's rest. And this demoniac comes out, right? Filled with demons. And Jesus takes all those demons and puts them in some pigs, right? The, the pigs are going crazy and it's chaotic. And the next thing you see that you take in are these pigs going down this embankment and drowning 2,000 of them in this body of water. Now, there's probably about 750 or so chairs in, in this building right here, in this room. Think about 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of smell, right? And a lot of chaotic noise and then fill them with demons, and I'm sure it gets even worse. Think about that moment where they're watching those pigs go down the embankment and, and drown themselves into that water. It's a, it's a shocking image, but can I make the argument that Jesus, I think, wants it to be shocking. I think there's an element that, that Jesus wants his disciples to know and those that were gathered that day to see the effects of the enemy on someone's life. It's like 2,000 pigs' carcasses laying dead in a sea. There's destruction and chaos. And all of that was in that one man. Whew. That would have been a powerful image that I'm sure none of them would ever forget. 2,000 pigs gone, dead, drowned. But then looking at the man, quiet and peace upon him. A man that had been filled with demons is now standing there, quiet and at peace, shalom. Man, this is the picture of redemption, right? The, the 2,000 pigs laying dead in the sea and the, the visual image of death and what was once chaos and then contrasted with the man who was standing there who once had all of that inside of him and now he's set free to have peace set free from all the turmoil and chaos and abuse that those demons put him through for so many years. And there he stands. That had been such a powerful moment to witness and to see and to ask the question, do you believe that God can do anything? Do you believe that all things are possible with him? And then to ask the question, I know you can, you can calm the storms at sea, Jesus, with your authority and your power, but can you calm the storms that are inside of me? And Jesus says, yes, Jeff, I can calm the storms that are inside of you, the chaos and the brokenness and maybe even the damage that the enemy has done on your life. Do you believe God can restore you again? And the answer, according to our text this morning, is absolutely yes. There can be redemption in the name of Jesus. Now look with me at verse 14, because how could you keep all this in? If you saw this happen, what would you do? <laughs> if you saw the pigs and you saw the man, and what would you do? Look at verse 14. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. You imagine, imagine as they rushed out and their pigs are in this big body of water. You know what they'd be thinking? Where am I going to get my bacon? There's all the bacon. Well, can, we, can we salvage some of it? <laughs> Probably not. But they'd be thinking, that's a lot of money, right? There's a lot of money in that sea. That's all of our, those are our pigs, we sell those for profit. And, and the thought of like, what are we going to do now? And then the shock of seeing this man standing there. Is this the, is this the guy? Look at, look at verse 15. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began to plead with Jesus, what? To go away and leave them alone. A, a couple things there. Number one, just being able to take in and say, this is the man that for so many years was in the tombs and, and running around the hills 
and yelling and screaming. And, and remember the time we, we tried to chain him up because he was a danger to himself and to other people? Which, by the way, don't do that. That's, that's, that's not good. That's really bad. But they were afraid, so they chained him up. And they left him in the tombs. And they're saying, that's, this is that guy? This is, this is the guy that we were chaining up? No way. No way. This is him. Look at their response to that kind of power and authority. It says they were afraid. Do you remember another time where there was a group of people that were afraid when they saw Jesus' power and authority? We just read it, right? The verse right before, we just saw it. It was the disciples that were in the boat and they saw Jesus stop the winds and the waves and says they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, who can this be? And can I make the argument? That's exactly what these people are saying. They see the pigs. What happened here? Well, there were these demons and they went into the pigs and the pigs went down the thing and then they died. And who's this guy? That's the place where the demons came from. This guy. And, he, and Mark says he was fully clothed and perfectly sane. And their hearts went the same place the disciples' hearts went. Who can this be? Who has that kind of power and authority to redeem and to save this life? Who we thought, never. God could never do that. And then their next response, I still don't get and understand. But look what they say. Go away and leave us alone. I mean, my thought process, process would be, Jesus, I've got an uncle who could use you right now, right? I've got some people who may or may not be demonically possessed, right? But I feel like you could be used back in our town. Like, Jesus, uh, come with me. But they were so afraid and maybe angry about the pigs that they say, get away from here. Go back to the other side of the lake. They are lost and they are confused. Listen, they, they, they chose to, to not have Jesus come back with them. And, and I, I think this is an amazing thing. Jesus doesn't force his way into their homes. He doesn't. He doesn't say, well, I'm coming with you whether you like it or not. Actually, in a moment here, we're going to see Jesus get back in the boat. He's going to honor their request to leave the, the area. It, the, the enemy had tried to push Jesus back, get back in the boat, go back across. And Jesus didn't go. Jesus redeems this man, plants the mustard seed, says, listen, I'm going to bring a little light to this side of the sea. But then he's going to get back in the boat at their request. And can I make the argument to you that Jesus will not force his way into your life. There's a decision that you will make to say, I want to honor you. I want to follow you with my life. He'll never force his way in. Jesus is, is the image I get is he's gentle and lowly. And he'll call you. And maybe this morning he's calling you, but he'll never force his way into your life, onto the shores of your life. He says, listen, Jeff, I'm here. I'll help deal with that storm. I want to walk with you. I want, I, want to, I want to encourage you to walk with me. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to force my way upon you. Jesus is, is so good like that. But he doesn't leave them alone. And this is the interesting twist. This is the mustard seed uh, planted that's going to grow into a bush. Look what he does. This is incredible to me. Because up until this point, it's like, hey, Jesus, you restored a man's life to him again. You started that process of, of bringing him back into the image of God and who he was called to be. And if we just stopped right there, incredible story, right? The fact that you redeemed this man, incredible. But I want to see the mustard seed. What, what did you plant, Jesus? Tell us more. Look at verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus, you've changed my life. You've radically changed my life. Let me go with you into the boat. Let me be one of your disciples. Let me follow you. Let me follow you. But Jesus said, no. What? Does Jesus ever say no to anyone? I mean, he says, no, you can't go into the boat. Here's why. Go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Now check this out. 
So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone, everyone was amazed at what he told them. Jesus says, my friend, you cannot get in this boat. I came across the sea. I came onto the shore. I dealt with those demons because I wanted to redeem your life, save your soul, and set you back again. And now here's the thing. You have to go tell your family. And by the way, he doesn't just tell his family. What does he do? He goes to the whole region and starts sharing this thing that God had done. Jesus told him, I want you to tell him this message, that God was merciful to you that he saved you by his grace and his mercy. He was merciful to you, powerful. The little seed is planted, and now the kingdom of God is growing in that dark region of the area, and it's growing and growing and growing through his testimony. Now, can you imagine his testimony? Can you imagine when he showed up or if he had conversations with someone, and he may start with something like, hey, you remember that guy that was in the tombs? Remember that he would, he would scream at night, he'd run through the hills, and, and we all were afraid of that guy. You remember that guy? And they'd be like, yeah, I totally know that guy. I've heard stories about him, pretty crazy. Uh, he used to cut himself and all this other stuff, and, and it, was, it was insane. And he's like, that was me, right? Can you imagine that? And you remember the story about the 2,000 pigs? Yeah, I heard it was 10,000. No, it was, two, no, was 2,000 pigs, right? Remember that story? That, that was me. And they'd be like, no way. There's no way that was you. You? Like, you seem like a pretty altogether guy. There's no way that guy in the tombs is you. And he would demonstrate and say, yes, it was me. Probably show markings on his arms and so show the things that that he had cut himself in, in, in those times of darkness. And then he would say what Jesus told him, but God, by God's mercy, but by God's grace, I stand here before you and I have my family back. And maybe you'd say, I'm back to work again. And God has restored me, even though I had demons living within me. And I thought about this, and I thought, man, this is not too much unlike some of our stories. And and demonic possession, maybe, maybe, but, but maybe just brokenness and lostness and separation from God. I think there's a moment in our lives where we've experienced those things where we needed God's mercy to draw us back and call us back into relationship with him again. And Jesus goes into this man's storm simply to restore him back again. And I will just make this statement to you. That's his desire for you. That's his desire for you this morning, no matter where you find. Because somebody might say, well, I'm too far gone. And I would just say, According to this text, are you really too far gone? Because this guy has around 2,000 demons living inside of him. I would think that's too far gone, right? So I don't know where you stand this morning. Maybe you would say, I am too far gone. You just don't even know the things that I've done. I'm like, well, this text, I think this guy was pretty far gone. I think God can do a work in your life no matter where you're coming from. God will restore you and redeem you and move you back into understanding that you were created in the image of God that you have value and you have purpose. One of those purposes will be that he will then say, Jeff, go out in my name and interfere with the enemy and use your testimony and your story and interfere with the work of the enemy because God's kingdom is growing. It's advancing on the face of the earth. And he's saying to people like you and I, join that work. (laughs) Join me by Jesus' power and authority. Amen? Let's pray. Yes, Lord. God, I believe this morning that throughout all of Refuge and all this weekend, uh, Lord, you're doing work. You're doing heart work that really only you can do. And when we started off this this time this morning, uh, we asked the question, is it really true that you, with you all things are possible? And I absolutely, Lord, believe it is absolutely true. If you can calm the winds and the waves, and if you can settle a demonic man's personal and spiritual storm, then Lord, what can't you do? And so I pray for big things this morning. Lord, as we, we go to our prayer list and we say, Lord, what about? And Lord, what about? Lord, would you just answer that in every facet? Lord, would you come to us and minister to us and by your power and your authority, use us. 
Lord, I pray for your kingdom advancement in these hallways of refuge and outside of these hallways of refuge. All this week, would we be people who have the mindset of interfering with the enemy's work on those people that we care about and we love and those people you bring in our pathway. Would we be bold and courageous to interrupt and interfere the work of the enemy in people's lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.